Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. We come together for the 27th annual climate meeting 30 years after the adoption of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, 25 years since we adopted the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, and seven years following yet another historic milestone, the Paris Agreement adopted in 2015. When the convention was adopted in 1992, global emissions were approximately 27 gigatons annually. This has risen to about 40 gigatons, while carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere has also steadily increased. For the past eight consecutive years, documented by the UN, to be the hottest years in recorded history, each new year has been hotter than the previous year. The whole world is reeling from the staggering impact of climate change. The spread, scale, and frequency of disasters like hurricanes, typhoons, wildfires, and heat waves, melting sea ice, and glaciers, droughts and desertification, floods and rising sea levels in numerous regions of all continents indicate that humanity is confronting unprecedented devastation on a global scale. The state of climate and the of climate in Africa reports lay it bare, high water stress, is estimated to affect about 250 million people in Africa and is expected to displace up to 700 million people by 2030. In the past 50 years, drought-related hazards have claimed the lives of over half a million people and led to economic losses of over 70 billion US dollars in the region. More than 1,000 flood-related disasters were reported involving more than 20,000 deaths in Africa alone over this period. It is estimated that by 2050, climate impacts could cost African nations US dollars 50 billion annually. The Horn of Africa region, including Kenya, is experiencing the worst drought in 40 years. Two consecutive years without rain have visited misery on millions of people. 2.5 million livestock have died in Kenya this year alone, causing economic losses of more than US dollars 1.5 billion. Two days ago, we went to distribute food relief to 4.3 million affected Kenyans in an emergency program that has forced us to reallocate funds budgeted for education and health. The trade-offs we are forced to make between indispensable public goods is evident that climate change is directly threatening our people's lives, health, and future. Moreover, Due to drought, many children have now dropped out of school. We have been compelled to make school feeding a priority in order to keep our children in class. Kenya's world-renowned wildlife heritage has not been spared either, and carcasses of elephants, zebras, wildebeest, and many other wild fauna litter our parks. We have had to spend US dollars, three million, to supply feed and water to wildlife in the last three months. Again, this backdrop, the lengthy discussions at COPS with its stalling, delaying tactics and procrastination that have hampered implementation and delivery is simply cruel and unjust. We cannot afford 
to spend more time scutting around the real issues and we must break out of the open-ended, process-focused discussions we are trapped in. Further delay will make us busy spectators as calamity wipes out lives and livelihoods. As we speak, Mr. Chairman, the pledge made 13 years ago in Copenhagen, committing US dollars 100 billion annually remains unfulfilled. Such a gracious and unexplained default is a major cause of persisting distrust and neither is there any sound reason for the continuing pollution. In stark contrast, Kenya, a country with far less resources than the average developed country, has foregone pollution industrialization and growth opportunities and intentionally invested in green, green energy. It must be recalled that Kenya has tremendous hydrocarbon and coal deposits which could go a long way in fueling the engines of our development. Nevertheless, due to resolute commitment, our electricity grid is 93% green. This morning, we signed a framework agreement for collaboration on the development of sustainable green industries in Kenya with an investor to produce 30 gigawatts of green hydrogen in Kenya. There exists opportunities in Kenya to produce 20 gigawatts of wind power, 10 gigawatts of geothermal electricity, and being at the equator, considerable amount of solar energy. Green energy production opportunities are vast in Kenya and throughout Africa. In the East Africa alone, for example, there exists sufficient hydroelectric potential to produce 100,000 megawatts, and if properly exploited, could generate enough clean energy for the whole of the continent. Instead of struggling to power industrialization using dirty energy, which is costly and destroying our planet, we want to make a case for developed economies to decarbonize their production by directing industrial investments to Africa and making use of clean energy to manufacture for the whole world. COP26 established the class core dialogue to formulate funding arrangements for measures to prevent, mitigate, and remedy loss and damage associated with adverse effects of climate change. Loss and damage is not an abstract topic of endless dialogue. It is our daily experience and the living nightmare of millions of Kenyans and hundreds of millions of Africans. A phenomenon of rising water levels in Rift Valley Lakes was experienced in Kenya in 2020 and generated humanitarian crisis of unprecedented levels. Approximately 75,000 households were displaced in 13 counties with a total population of 379,000 requiring urgent humanitarian assistance. The affected communities endured disruption for their livelihoods losing homes, grazing, grazing lands, and farming fields, while social amenities like schools, health facilities, markets, fish landings, and processing facilities, once thriving hotels, curio shops, resorts, and lodges, electricity lines, and water supply and sanitation units were swallowed by water bodies. Loss and damage must therefore be addressed with a level of seriousness which demonstrates fairness, urgency, and consideration. Africa contributes less than 3% of the pollution responsible for climate change, but is most severely impacted by the ensuing crisis. Africa, and it is therefore only fair and proper that this conference takes necessary measures to recognize Africa's special needs and circumstances under the Paris Agreement in line with the convention and relevant decisions adopted by previous COPs. Beyond 
the overdue, legitimate, and priority concerns of resilience, mitigation, loss, and damage, Africa offers unique potential to play an indispensable positive role in the planet's climate change future. Africa's vast tracts of land, deep treasures of diverse natural resources, tremendous untapped renewable energy potential, and a youthful, dynamic, and skilled workforce constitute the continent's irresistible credentials. Properly deployed, these assets could be crucial in driving global mitigation efforts while creating new economic opportunities in the continent. I am convinced of the need to more comprehensively showcase the opportunities that abound in Africa, such as green energy, smart agriculture, decarbonized manufacturing, e-mobility, and green building, all aimed at the attainment of zero carbon by 2050. As the coordinator of the Committee of African Heads of State and Governments on Climate Change, I therefore plan to convene a continental summit focusing on climate action next year. Accordingly, you are all invited to take part in Africa's march to sustainable economic transformation and green growth. Kenya's next significant export will be carbon credits. This is why we call for simplified, more transparent carbon market systems that directly benefit communities and not just intermediaries. Back home, I just launched an ambitious project to increase the national tree cover from the current 12% to 30% in 10 years. We intend to accomplish this by fast growing 15 billion trees on approximately 10.6 million hectares of land through the, throughout the country at an estimated cost of US dollars 500 million. In conclusion, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the face of impending catastrophe, whose warning signs are already unbearably disastrous, weak action is unwise. No action is dangerous. At this point, in the progression of this calamity, we have few choices and little time. Our discourse must focus on delivery, and our conversation must be centered on our commitments and implementation. I call on every delegate here today to rise to the challenge of this moment, to make difficult but necessary decisions, and seize transformative opportunity from the grasp of climate disaster. This means honoring spending commitments for mitigation and adaptation, and mobilizing increased financial flows to those affected, especially in Africa. By keeping our promises and being bound by our word, we will demonstrate to people across the globe that their leaders are their honest agents and true guarantors. COP, this is our golden chance to vindicate present generations who took, who look to us to lead the way in preserving our planet and to perform our role as trustees of future generations. The way things are, we might never have a more opportune time and there might never be a better chance. I thank you.